Hello again. It's been all quiet on the Eurozone front in recent weeks, with the Bank of Japan and the Fed grabbing all the headlines. To find out where the profit opportunities lie, I've been speaking with Craig Earlham from Alpari. Always looking for a new angle to the Eurozone story. Uh, a few months ago, we were talking about the concerns over bond yields in countries like Italy and Spain moving above 7%, but we seem to have gone the other way now. Yields, 10-year yields in uh, Italy and Spain are now hovering around the 4% mark. That just doesn't seem feasible. Well, I think there's a number of reasons for this, really. I think, for one, we've got the fact that we've got such so much excess liquidity now in the financial markets with the uh, Federal Reserve pumping $85 billion every month into the financial system. You've now got the Bank of Japan joining in, as well as well as a number of the other central banks. I think we've just got so much liquidity now in the financial system that you've got investors looking in search of yields. We've got uh, equity markets at record highs, and now we're seeing bond yields as well come down to record lows in some cases, like uh, in the US and also in Germany. So I think people are now just going in, out in search of yields. And the fact that you've now got that ECB backstop following Mario Draghi's uh, comments last summer. I think people are a lot, ha a, lot, a lot happier to put their money into, say, Spanish and Italian bonds, which is why we are seeing these uh, yields come so much lower. I just don't think there's that default risk that we had, say, a year ago. But do you think investors really have the stomach for the risk if we start to see, I don't know, a, a breakup in the Italian coalition government or concerns again about Spanish unemployment? Surely those yields have to rise? Well, you'd think so, but I think one of the things, like I said, it's cushioning it right now is the fact that we've got so much liquidity. So I think at this moment, people are willing uh, to take that extra little bit of risk. I think one of the things we've learned from the Eurozone over, say, the past 12 months or so is that the, the Eurozone and the ECB are going to be extremely reluctant to let any of the countries leave the Eurozone, and that includes even a small country such as Cyprus and even Greece. So I think the fact that the ECB and the Eurozone are so reluctant to let countries like this leave, I think the, the prospect of Italy or Spain leaving the Eurozone, even if we do have further political issues or further unemployment increases I think that's now just seeming a bit un well a bit unlikely uh, in terms of the whole eurozone situation we seem to be in a bit of a limbo at the moment uh, the OECD have chucked in their opinion now calling for negative bank rates or negative rates for banks and also uh, more QE but do you think that's realistic for the eurozone isn't it isn't it the case that there has to be another major crisis for the eurozone policymakers to act I think, I, think, I think you could be right there. I mean, there's always going to be calls for the ECB to do more. But I think one thing that we've seen from the ECB over the past, well, over the past number of years is that they won't do anything until they're absolutely forced to. We saw a similar idea with the LTROs. It was only when Italy and Spain yields got above that unsustainable 7% level. Uh, and even the, the comments last summer, I think we were reaching pretty unsustainable levels when, they, when Mario Draghi said that they'd do anything to save the Eurozone, essentially uh, verbally interfering in the, in the currency markets, in the bond markets in order to save the euro as it were and then coming up obviously with the OMT so I think we do have to see the ECB really pushed into making these decisions and despite the fact that we saw Mario Draghi make these comments last month about a potential uh, negative uh, deposit rate I don't really see that as a realistic option I really to be honest I'm going to be very surprised if we see even a cut in the uh, referee rate next month given the fact that they just the ECB do not like to act unless they're really uh, absolutely forced to because one of the problems that we tend to have is that if the ECB do act and therefore take a little bit of the pressure off uh, some of these peripheral countries and something we've seen actually since last summer is we do tend to get that little bit of uh, a bit they become a little bit lax when it comes to implementing some of these reforms we have seen them take the foot off the pedal over the past 12 months and there is that danger that it could happen even further. Uh, just to quickly turn our attention to the US, uh, tapering is the buzzword at the moment. I don't know who, in who invents these terms and decides that they're going to be so important, but everyone's talking about tapering. What's your take, take on tapering and its effect on the US dollar? Well, I think obviously now we are seeing the US dollar appreciate not not necessarily only to not necessarily today, but over the past uh, month or so, we have seen an appreciation in the US dollar in anticipation of some form of tapering down the line. Uh, whether I actually expect to see tapering is another thing. I mean, people are talking about it as early as June. I think that's absolutely off the table. I think even September may be a little bit too early. I think one of the things that we saw from Ben Bernanke at that last uh, press conference is that. Yes, he is, uh, con he is considering the prospect of tapering this QE3 program, but I don't think he's thinking about it anytime soon. I think, again, this is another example of maybe verbal intervention. We're seeing, the, we're seeing these equity markets hit these all-time highs almost on a daily basis, and I think Bernanke actually probably thought, I need to do something to stop this go getting out of control and stop these uh, get reaching these 
extremely overbought levels, already overbought levels, but to almost just put a cap on the uh, rally for now. And the only way to do that without essentially changing this or tapering this quantitative easing is to verbally intervene. And I think that's what we've seen. I really do think it's going to be December before we do actually see any form of tapering. OK, given all the central bank action, what we're seeing in equity markets, in terms of currencies, where are the real profit opportunities? Well, I mean, it's very difficult to say, to be honest. I mean, we've got the dollar yen at this stage, which seems to be consolidating to an extent. I think we are going to see it pull back towards that 100 level and maybe just retest that as a new area of support before we see it move higher, maybe towards that 105. But given all the issues that we've got in the uh, Japanese government bonds, all we're essentially seeing right now is a huge amount of volatility, which can be good, especially for short term traders. But anyone wanting to get on that move and ride it higher is probably going to have to wait a little bit longer. I think we are going to see further weakness in uh, the dollar in the euro dollar i think we're still going to see much uh, more weakness come especially if we break 128 i think 128 is a huge uh, level for the euro but then you've got the other pairs as well we don't only have to focus on the majors we've got some uh, very good patterns uh, forming in some of the other pairs so even say dollar cad i think we've got a real good uptrend going there and i think there's other pairs which we can now take a look at now and maybe take a bit of the focus off say dollar yen euro dollar and cable